Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War. Yesterday marked the 157th anniversary of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox Station, Virginia by Robert E. Lee. I'd hoped to get this episode out on the anniversary, but life kind of got in the way and it's coming out a day late. But better a little bit late than never. But I thought uh, for this anniversary, I wanted to tell the story uh, of someone who actually participated in the surrender and uh, let his words uh, speak about uh, about what he went through in the final closing hours of the war. Unfortunately, I did find a, a very good little reminiscence written by a, a Mississippian who was at Appomattox and did surrender there with the army. And the story I'm going to tell you today is about Charles Winthrop Babbitt II of Natchez. He had uh, been, uh, he had, was a native Mississippian, born and raised in Natchez. Uh, when the war broke out, uh, he uh, started off in Company E of the 4th Louisiana Infantry Battalion, which is known as the Natchez Rifles. They were a Natchez raised regiment, but they decided to cross the river and uh, become a Louisiana regiment. So he served with the 4th Louisiana in Virginia uh, for the first two years of the war. Uh, very early in his service, uh, they recognized his skills. Um, Babbitt was a college graduate. He had attended the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard and had graduated uh, magna cum laude in 1858. So he had, uh, he had some, uh, some very good scientific background. And so he, very early in his, uh, his service, he ended up getting detailed off to work with the engineers around Charleston. And uh, by early 1863, the engineers decided they wanted to keep him, and he ended up being transferred to the Company B of the 1st Confederate in, uh, Engineer Troops. And he was going to serve with them as a first lieutenant for the remainder of the war. And he, it would be with that command that he served uh, at Appomattox. And this is a, a, a reminiscence that was written by Babbitt many years after the war. so. Uh, you always got to worry about the the accuracy of, of memory you know memories that are written down many years later but uh, um, I think it gives you a good feel for what uh, what he went through and uh, it's not a very long reminiscence but uh, I think you'll enjoy it and uh, this is how it starts he says it is hardly necessary to mention the ever memorable days of the week preceding when Lee's army commenced the retreat from Petersburg and harassed night and day without intermission until reduced to about 8,000 men on Sunday morning, 10th of April, 1865. This remnant found its last road barred by Grant's army at Appomattox Courthouse. Our regiment had halted on the roadside about sunrise of that morning. General Lee was with his staff, was in the road in a deep cut almost under the point where the rider happened to be standing when a courier from General Gordon reported his corps reduced to a frazzle and too large a force in his front to resist unless speedily reinforced or words to that effect. Lee then ordered Colonel Talcott Command, commanding the 1st uh, Engineer Regiment to issue ammunition and move his regiment to an open hill on the left of the road in the direction of the courthouse and across Appomattox Run and take up a position on its crest facing a skirt of timber into which a large force of Federal cavalry appeared to be moving. With all haste we proceeded to execute the order and we soon found ourselves in line of battle on an open ridge with heavy timber about 100 yards in front from which we every moment expected a withering fire from an enemy well posted in the timber. The outlook was anything but pleasant to your writer and I think the same feeling was shared by most of his command. There we were with loaded guns standing at a make ready but with a warning from the commander not to fire until the Confederate cavalry scouts had passed into the lines, and a few of whom were scurrying through the woods with all haste. And one notified us soon that as we saw a man on a dun horse leading his cavalry, we would have hot work. 
The suspense became terrible for a few moments. Directly a man came out of the woods on horseback. He was in his shirt sleeves and to all appearances appeared to be one of our cavalrymen making his escape. He rode straight toward the colors and when within about 75 feet of the line, he was hailed and told to pass around or he might be shot. Still advancing, he used the words, your army has surrendered or throw down your arms and surrender. At any rate, the word surrender was loudly used. Sergeant exclaimed, that's a damned Yankee, shoot him. The man unfortunately wheeled his horse and putting spurs attempted to fly. Before any orders to the contrary could be issued, and in less time than I have been writing, a volley was fired into him, and a horse and rider fell to the ground. Struggling from under the horse, he rose to his feet, and reeling and staggering, he, he approached the colors, exclaiming, You oughtn't to have fired. It's a flag of truce. And when within a few feet of the line, he fell dead on his face. Poor fellow, his was a sad fate. On the excitement of the occasion, he was either riding the lines to spread the news in advance, knowing that a flag of truce had gone in, or as others thought, he had ridden forward to claim the honor of capturing a whole regiment by himself, as he carried no white flag and had his naked sword in his hand, such as might have been his intention. However, as soon as the volley was fired, an officer rode rapidly in from the front, with the order to cease firing as a flag of truce had gone in. What did it mean? Not many of us were willing to believe that the hour had come. Some even ventured the opinion that the force on our front had sent in a flag of truce. Soon our artillery posted the, to the right of us was seen to move to the rear. Groups of officers collected and were soon joined by federal officers who rode in from the front and appeared to be on the best of terms with each other. Soon the meeting was explained. A federal courier rode among our lines and asking for the commanding officer and the name of the regiment informed him that General Lee had surrendered. And then for the first time we were convinced that it was all over. Many a head was drooped in sadness that the cause was lost and doomed. But still there was a feeling of relief when we reflected that, that we had done all that was in our power to do and that blood and carnage were at an end. It was hard to realize that it could be possible that General Lee would surrender, and even to the last moment some hoped that it must be a mistake, but this only lasted a few moments, as the inevitable truth was too apparent in all that was transpiring. We learned that the troops in front of us were those, I think, of General Chamberlain, and for a while there was considerable anxiety as to what would be meted out to us uh, for the death of the poor fellow who lay there on the ground. No notice seemed to be taken of this, however, and in a few moments orders came for the regiment to move back down the, the road which we had previously left, and recrossing the creek we filed into a farm lot in which was an empty building, probably a tobacco house. When we entered the lot, General Lee, with some of his staff, was standing at the open door of this building, and he holding an order book in his hand for a table was engaged in writing a paper which he handed to General Babcock. I believe of Grant's staff. This officer and another mounted their horses and rode back to the courthouse. During their absence, General Lee procured a camp stool and took his seat under a large apple tree, which stood a little to the one side of the house and about 15 or 20 feet from it. While waiting the return of the officers, he became very much annoyed by numbers of federal officers who claimed to be quartermaster or commissary, inquiring about the condition of the prisoners, which were in our rear many evidently coming out of curiosity to see the Confederate leader and have a word from him. Some appeared to be civilians, but all on the same errand until there was scarcely room to move about. Calling an officer, he ordered the grounds to be surrounded with a guard, uh, all intruders turned out and no one to be admitted except by order of a staff officer. As this guard was taken from our regiment, which was the only body of troops near, we of course were in the ring and saw all that occurred. Several attempts were made by federal officers to pass in and high words were passed at the idea of a surrendered army putting out guards and etc. But all to no purpose. You cannot pass had to be submitted to even uh, though uttered by a tattered rebel. They silently waited on the outside evidently thinking that Babcock or Custer would give the password, but no indeed. 
Fall back, accompanied by a dignified move of the hand, was all that was vouchsafed on their arrival, and with disappointment on their faces, they quietly obeyed the order and moved off. Two of them evidently were determined not to be outdone in this manner, and riding down the road took up a position near the cut, where they knew the party must pass on their return to the courthouse. On the return of General Babcock, a short consultation was held, and General Lee then mounted his gray horse and, escorted by federal officers, rode toward the courthouse. Dressed in his handsomest uniform, with a magnificent sword by his side, he rode out in all the dignity and grandeur of a cavalier, and as none, of, uh, and as none but Lee could ride, as calm and serene to all outward appearances as though on a review. All eyes followed him, and as it was the last day that ever saw him, the picture is indelibly fixed in my mind. He rode a little to the front of the federal officers, who certainly could not have shown more courtesy or respect, even to their own great commander. And that's how uh, Bab uh, Babbitt ends his, uh, his short tale about the surrender at Appomattox. And I just want to give you a little more background on Babbitt. When the war was over, uh, he went back to his hometown of Natchez, uh, married and had a family, uh, became a very successful uh, engineer and uh, uh, surveyor. And for a number of years, in fact, he was the official surveyor for the city of Natchez. So he became uh, quite a prominent citizen. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of the projects that he worked on as a civil engineer was the repair of the road running through the Natchez National Cemetery, where the Union soldiers uh, uh, who died in the Civil War near Natchez were buried. Uh, Babbitt uh, himself uh, lived to the ripe old age of 69, and he passed away on August 2nd, 1903, he's, and he's buried in the Natchez City Cemetery. Uh, in his obituary, it was said of him, on account of his faithful devotion to friends and his duty, he made warm friends of all whom he met, which I think is a very good uh, uh, epitaph for someone. Uh, to be thought of as a friend by all that you had met, uh, I think that says a lot about a person. And uh, that brings to an end this, uh, this short uh, episode about uh, the surrender of, uh, at Appomattox. And one last thing, though. In the last episode, I mentioned I was going to have a giveaway of uh, my latest article, which is in the current issue of Artilleryman Magazine. Well, that time has come. Everyone that uh, had uh, become a, a, mem a member of the group and had liked the last video and submitted a comment, uh, put your name in the cup. Yes, the cup. And uh, this is actually a, a favorite of mine. This is uh, a cup that has a picture of the flag of the 15th Mississippi Infantry on it. Uh, there were a whole series of these done uh, a number of years ago to help raise money for the preservation of uh, flags uh, that are at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And it was quite successful, and they were able to preserve a number of the flags, including this one of the 15th Mississippi. But inside of this cup, I've got all of the names. And I am actually going to give away uh, two of these magazines. And I will personally autograph them as well, however you would like. But uh, I'm going to pick my two winners now. Okay, the first winner, Stephen Burns. Stephen, if you'll get in touch with me, I will uh, get your address and get this mailed out to you. Uh, I'll also send you, a, send you a, a reminder. Okay, time for number two. Okay, here we go. Our second winner B.B. Heigl. B.B. Heigl. Okay, so Stephen Burns and B.B. Heigl, if you will contact me, uh, I will get your uh, mailing addresses and get you your uh, autographed magazines. And thank you so much for, uh, for watching. Uh, I hope you continue to uh, uh, watch the content that, uh, that I put out. If you would, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. It really helps me gauge the, the uh, uh, the interest in my channel and how many are how many episodes I should try and put out uh, Also, if you'd give it a like I would really appreciate it uh, if, As always if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, please leave them. I'll be glad to answer them uh, I'm not always the quickest at getting to those comments, but uh, I, I get to them as quickly as I can but uh, thank you very much and uh, have a great day